We're continuing Colossians 2, where Paul is trying to help the Colossian believers understand the fullness, the completeness of the redemption that they have in Christ. And where the Colossian believers have been continually confronted by these other philosophies that have tried to work their way into the church to lead them astray. He's trying to convince them not to be led astray, not to be deluded, or in this um, passage we're going to read today, not to be taken captive by these philosophies of the world, these empty deceit, he calls it, um, to be led away to the, to the, from the simplicity of the gospel and the fullness of the redemption that we have in Christ. And in verse 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits, or another way to translate that would be elemental principles or basic principles of the world. Probably a better way to translate that. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elementary principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. That's as far as we're going to get through the passage today. Um, but there's a lot in here. It says, don't be taken captive. And by captive, by captivity, Paul's not referring to a physical captivity. As Paul was writing this letter, he was literally in physical captivity. He was in prison, most likely in Rome, where he had been for quite a while. And he's writing them from that captivity. In fact, the um, leader of this church in Colossae is actually in captivity with him, in physical chains with him, um, as he mentions in the letter to Philemon. Um, so he's not talking about a physical captivity. What Paul's talking about in this uh, passage here is a captivity of the mind. Okay, he's saying don't be taken captive in your mind, in your thinking. And this is something that Paul actually exhorts believers to in many of his letters. He says, let your, let, let your mind be like this. Let your thinking be like this. Um, think this way. You know, and he's trying to, to help uh, believers to to lift their minds off of the elementary principles of the world, the, the world basically from the perspective of humanity, and lift it up to a more elevated perspective, the perspective of God, an eternal perspective, a redemptive perspective, um, the, re the perspective of the one who created all that is, who was before all that is, the one in whom uh, wisdom exists and originates and has its beginning. Right? And so he's saying, see to it that no one takes you captive mentally um, in your thought process, in your mind. He says, by philosophy. What is philosophy? The word philosophy simply means the love of wisdom. Okay. And so, you know, wisdom is a good thing. It's spoken of throughout the Bible as a good thing. Um, you know, Proverbs, um, it continually exhorts us to seek out wisdom. Um, but there is a differentiation in the Bible between the types of wisdom that there is. There is the wisdom that is from above, the wisdom that comes from God, okay? And then there's a worldly wisdom, okay? And the Bible definitely um, differentiates those two. Basically, the wisdom of man is foolishness to God, um, is the way that the Bible frames that. Okay, I wanted to read a passage from Proverbs chapter 8. Where it says, the Lord possessed me, speaking of wisdom. So this is wisdom personified, right? Wisdom is speaking in this passage, saying, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world, when he, had, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle in the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies from above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, there I was beside him, like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the children of men. This is speaking of the wisdom that is of God, the wisdom that was always there in God before the beginning of time and before the beginning of space and matter, energy, and all things that exist today. And this is the wisdom that the Bible exhorts us to seek out, okay? And this is differentiated from the wisdom of 
the world. This is wisdom from a higher perspective. Um, the, the way that I would describe the difference, this, this issue of perspective really is the main issue, right? Because we live in a world where we are clothed in human flesh and we are sort of subject to the five senses that we have and our own sort of limited experience and understanding of things, okay? And so we see the world from a certain perspective because of who we are, okay? Um, one of the examples would be um, the, the, the um, difference between human holiness or righteousness and the holy and holiness and righteousness of God. Um, there's an example of Isaiah in chapter 6 where he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated upon his throne. And he begins to describe the throne room of God, the worship of the cherubim, the um, smoke that filled the temple from the altar in, in the heavenly throne room of God. And um, Isaiah in his day was one of the most holy men, righteous men that walked the face of the earth. He was a prophet of God and compared to the people around him, um, even in himself, he must have felt like, man, these people are all such losers, you know, they're all so um, wicked. Um, and, and I'm the only one, you know, that's righteous and holy. And, and, and I'm sure he, he felt that way. And from a human perspective, he had a right to feel that way. According to human wisdom, he was righteous and holy. But when he stood in the presence of God, the words that came from his lips were, woe is me, I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. He had a heavenly perspective and his understanding of holiness and righteousness was instantly changed. I used to ride dirt bikes in the desert and um, we'd go out to a place called Ritchie Canyon. We'd ride um, for hours and hours out in the hills. We would just, we'd park our trucks, we'd unload our dirt bikes, get our gear on and we'd just take off. And what's funny about riding on a dirt bike is you can ride for a minute, two minutes and, and you stop and you turn and look back at the truck and the truck is like this little speck in the distance. Well, we'd ride for hours and hours. We'd just go take off exploring around, finding hills, finding things to jump and um, you know, having fun all day long. And sometimes when you're doing that, because it's a really hilly area, um, you'd kind of get in a valley somewhere and, and you're like, hey, let's head back to the truck and you get a little bit turned around. And so, you know, what we would do sometimes is we'd have to ride to the top of a hill and then kind of get our bearings and see, okay, where, okay, I think the truck's that way. And so we'll, can I take this path? And um, once you had been up on the hill and you could see, you know, from a higher perspective, you could sort of, you know, go back down to the valley and you could find your way. You kind of hold that vision you have in your mind of the higher perspective as you go down back into the valley and then you work your way back to where you want to go. This is how I'd liken um, the difference between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man. Okay, so when we are in Christ, um, he's going to say um, that in him, we read this in verse 9, all the fullness of God, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily and you've been filled in him who's in the head of all rule and authority. Okay, and so when we are saved by God, the, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ comes to dwell within us, inside of us. We're connected spiritually to deity, to the divine, to God himself, the creator of all things. When we're in his word, we're taking in the perspective, the wisdom of God, okay? And we receive, we begin to, to slowly, because of, at least myself, I, I'm pretty dense, it takes me a while to soak in these things and begin to have these things transform my thinking, my way of life, and eventually my behavior to reflect the wisdom and the ways of God. Okay, and when I regress, it's because my perspective changes to a lower perspective. But in touching that divine, in touching the holy things and the righteousness and the spirit of God and the word of God, those things begin to direct my perspective. And so that even when I'm in the midst of um, a human environment with my human senses, if I hold on to that vision of God, I can make my way in the world um, with using the wisdom and the perspective of God. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. Well, again, philosophy just means the love of wisdom. But the question of which, the question is, which wisdom are you loving? Are you loving the wisdom of the world? The wisdom that is taught from a, the perspective of humanity, from this perspective of what the Bible calls our wretched sin, right? Our total, absolute depravity. Um, we are so subject, so immersed in our own sinfulness that as we look around, our perspective is skewed. We're deep in the valley and the valley is dark and we don't know the way out, but we think we do because our perspective and our perception is skewed by our own sinfulness, right? 
he's saying, don't be taken captive by the, the love of the wisdom of this world, right? Instead, we want to look to the wisdom of God himself. Don't be taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the basic elementary principles of this world. In other words, don't be taken captive in your mind and your thinking by the thoughts and the mores and the values and the thinking of this world. And that is a real captivity because the, the way that we think, the way that we see things, what we believe directly affects how we behave. It, def, de, it affects the, the way that we, that we operate and act in this world and the path that our life ultimately takes. Don't be taken captive by bad thinking. Okay, and let this bad thinking infect you. And remember, he's talking to believers. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's sending this letter letter to Christians who have already received salvation. They've received the Holy Spirit. They've received redemption, right? And they're in Christ. And he's, But these other groups are coming into the church. These legalists that are saying, no, you have to follow the law in order to be saved. You have to keep following the law. It's not good enough just to be in Christ alone, right? The redemption in Christ doesn't save you completely. It just sort of gets you sort of in the door, but you still have to follow the law. And if you don't follow the law, you're going to lose that. All right. And then you have these others that are saying, no, but the salvation in Christ is not complete. You're not going to get all the wisdom and all the knowledge that you could unless you worship these demonic spirits on the side over here. These other angelic beings, but not angels, they're demons. Okay. Don't be taken captive by wrong thinking. And this is dominant in our culture. The world is captive in its thinking to, to worldly wisdom and worldly thinking that is contrary to the wisdom of God. He says, don't be taken captive by that. Don't let this stuff permeate your mind to affect your thinking, which will long-term affect your behavior, which will ultimately and eternally affect the course of your, your life and your eternal destination. He says, don't be taken captive by this philosophy, this empty deceit. Remember that the, the Bible calls the devil the father of lies. Jesus said he was a liar from the beginning, right? And that is his his MO, his modus operandi, is to deceive, is to deceive and to lead astray and to, to do so with lies. This is what our culture is permeated with, thinking and wisdom that is, that is really just deception, which is leading people astray, leading people away from the, the, the one true source of actual, real, godly wisdom and knowledge and salvation, ultimately, and redemption um, from our own sinful um, status and nature before God. He says, um, don't be taken captive by philosophy, empty to see according to human tradition, okay? According to human tradition, this is speaking back to the law, the legalists, right? Don't be taken captive and drawn back into this. Don't, don't, don't give up the freedom that you actually have in Christ, according to human tradition, to go back to following rules and trying to earn your way um, to salvation. He says, according to the elementary or basic principles of the world and not according to to Christ, okay? Let your focus be on Christ. Christ is sufficient. Christ is enough. Christ is everything you need. You need nothing else. You need no other spirit. You need no other deceiving angel, ones who've already been conquered by, by, the, by the blood of Jesus that was shed upon the cross, how he put them to open shame. Okay, don't be led astray by these other deceiving spirits. Don't be led astray by these legalists who want to drag you back to legalism and the law and trying to earn your way to righteousness when you've already received the righteousness that is of Christ. Christ's salvation is complete and total, and you're not going to ever redeem your own natural flesh. We await the redemption, the full redemption of our flesh that is in Christ. When he returns and catches us up to meet him in the air, then we will be made like him, Philippians says, right? So he says, um, just like he said in, in um, let's see, in, in, in verse four of chapter, he says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Okay, so he's saying, don't let yourself be deceived. Don't let yourself be drawn away from the simplicity of the gospel that is in Christ. He says, for in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Okay, this is important. Saying that in him, the full fullness of God dwells. Okay, bodily. There was a lie that was out there that Christ actually didn't come out, um, didn't come to earth in a body, that the body is naturally bad, the body is naturally broken, that we have to, you know, um, jump through a bunch of hoops to to redeem our flesh and escape our flesh 
but but Paul saying no, um, he came in a human body, and it was a broken, fallen human body that desired and craved all the things that our do, ours do, but his nature was divine. Okay, and so Christ lived the perfect life in a human body that was broken, and and paid the full penalty for the for the sin of humanity upon the cross. He lived out perfect righteousness, ob obedience to the law paid the full debt for that on the cross, okay, and, and ultimately redeemed. The human body that he dwelt in was glorified, okay, and now he lives in a glorified, perfected human body. This is going to be important for the next section, the next video that we do, but he's saying, um, he's saying, um, in him all the fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you, you believer, you Christian, have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. He is the head over everything, as the first chapter says. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, in heaven and on earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. Christ's redemption on our behalf, his perfect sinless life lived out for us, his death to pay the full penalty for our sin and accomplish all righteousness for, our, for us, it was perfect and complete. We've been redeemed, we've been justified, we're being sanctified in him and our flesh will ultimately be glorified by him, not by us. So he says, don't be led astray, don't be taken captive in your thinking. Seek out the wisdom that is above and not the wisdom that is below. I've gone a little long, so let's continue in the next Bible study.